Okay, let's pray before we read the word uh, in 2 Corinthians together. Father, we come to you looking for your help to understand your word, uh, to understand both what it was being said then and to understand what you want to use it for to say to us today. So, Lord, would you help us, we pray, as we depend on you fully, Lord. We don't want to rely on our own understanding, our own interpretations, Lord, or anything else. Lord, we come as we're going to be thinking about whether we are adequate or not. We come saying our understanding in itself is inadequate, Lord. But with your spirit to help us, it can be more than adequate. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We're going to be reading and focusing really from the second half of uh, verse 16 this morning. But uh, let's just read uh, earlier on in 2 Corinthians 2. We'll take it from verse 12. Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him, In every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God. Among those who are being saved. And among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death. And to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many. Peddling the word of God. But as from sincerity. As from God. We speak in Christ. In the sight of God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. But our adequacy is from God. Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not of the letter but of the spirit. For the letter kills but the spirit gives life. Hallelujah Hallelujah indeed. Uh, Last time we uh, looked at uh, the first few verses we read this morning, Uh, we saw that at Troas, Paul abandoned an open door for the gospel, something we see elsewhere he really wanted. But in this case, he chose to abandon it because he wanted even more to find Titus. And we thought probably, at least partly, to hear how the Corinthian church was doing. He was concerned for the lost, but he was also concerned for how the church he had founded was doing. Uh, And so he left behind an open door there. We saw that uh, he said Christ, uh, well, God leads us in triumph in Christ. We thought about the Roman victory parade uh, and how uh, the focus was on this great general who had won a victory. uh, But his soldiers would be behind him as well. And they would be lauded by the crowds for this victory that uh, really the general particularly uh, had won. And we saw that we can be part of that victory that Christ has won. Uh, victory over death in the future, uh, but also uh, victory in life now, in our sin and our temptation, that we can have victory over those. Uh, victory over trials and affliction. Uh, victory over even Satan himself. And victory over things done to us by others, when we might have reacted badly, and we can actually overcome and reward evil with good. We saw we have to play our part Christ wants to lead us in triumph, but we have to follow. We have to accept what he's done and live in it, in the truth of it, walking in it by faith. And we saw that there's an aroma, a fragrance of knowing God that we are to display to others. The more we know him and are changed by him, the more people will smell that fragrance uh, when they spend time with us. And in the light of those amazing truths, he goes on to ask, Who is adequate for these things? And that's where we pick things up today. We'll actually deal with the adequacy question uh, second. Well, first of all, he says, 
that we are not like many peddling the word of God. Peddling uh, uh, can be seen as making a trade out of, making something out of it. Uh, doing it for some personal gain or some personal goal. Uh, it's sad that he said many were like this. You know, we've got deceptions today and we've got many deceptions. It's not new. Some of the deceptions might be new. But, you know, in Paul's day, at the start of the early church, there were many trying to preach or share the word of God or have something to do with spreading the word for personal gain. Which is really sad. Uh, Maybe for money, maybe for position, maybe to show off. But it wasn't genuine. It wasn't out of love for others and service to God. We see that in Philippians 1, don't we? Where he says, some preach Christ out of envy. Uh, Although he rejoices that Christ is preached, amazingly. But he says, some are preaching Christ from wrong motives. And some from right ones. It could also be translated as corrupting the word of God. And he may have been thinking about people who mix the word of God with other things. Uh, If you flick across to uh, chapter 4 of the letter. uh, Chapter 4 and verse 2. He says, we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, It says not adulterating the word of God. Now, deceitful wine merchants uh, in Bible times would mix wine with water. Uh, adulterating it in order to uh, make more money. They would take the same amount of wine and mix it. Um, and supermarkets would never do something like that today, obviously. Um, they just package things in uh, ridiculously big packages to make it look like there's more food in it than there was. But I'm not bitter. Um, but uh, if you ever buy crisps or popcorn, you'll, you'll notice that. Obviously, I don't do that very often. But, you know, these uh, deceitful merchants, they would corrupt the wine. They would adulterate it. They would mix it. And there was certainly a lot of mixture being added to God's truths at this time. Greek thinking, Jewish thinking, adulterating the word. We have it today. Uh, Countless different things where they are taking God's word or God's truths or God's principles and mixing it. Mixing it very often with what our culture thinks, what our culture wants and mixing them together. But Paul and his companions weren't doing that. He says they brought it from sincerity, from a sincere, genuine love for those they preached to, and a sincere love of God. They weren't trying to build their own position, they were doing it because they cared for the people who they were speaking to. They weren't trying to gain something, they weren't doing it out of duty on its own. They were doing it because of their care for others. And the test of someone's care for others is how much they're willing to sacrifice for them. We see in this letter that Paul actually uh, wasn't uh, supported financially by them. He's made clear the principle that people who preach the word should be supported. But he chose not to use that right. He chose not to be supported by them because he cared so much for them. He didn't want to be... um, He didn't want to be a burden to them, shall we say. And so, he says, uh, we can say for sure that he was not um, being uh, disingenuous in the care he brought for others. But he really wanted to show that love he had for them. There was no question of him peddling the word of God. But he says they preached or they came as from God. They hadn't sent themselves as preachers. Some people set themselves up as preachers and they decide, I'm going to preach. And we could praise them in a sense for wanting to preach. But they, uh, Paul and his companions, had been sent by God. They'd been called, they'd been commissioned, they'd been sent out by God. And we see that in Acts, where God actually sets Paul and Barnabas aside and says, you are to uh, carry out this work. And they were, as God's ambassadors, they were to speak as from God. As if God himself were there speaking. Imagine if you saw God physically standing here this morning and preaching. Well, of course, 
Uh, I hope that as I'm preaching, something of God is coming through. Well, you know, if God was physically, uh, visibly stood here preaching, um, wow, we'd pay attention, you know. And we as preachers are called to preach and to be, uh, we are sent as from God. We are meant to be God's messengers. Now, of course, you will be certain to have detected something of me coming through when I talk. Uh, I suppose until we are perfect in heaven, none of us can be so purely from God that nothing of the flesh comes through at all. But it's our aim as preachers that we come as from God and we preach as from God and that there is less and less of us coming through and more and more of God. Of course, it should be true for all of us as we seek to be a witness in the, with the people around us. We should be more and more speaking as from God. You know, in uh, the example which Alan gave, uh, uh, praying uh, at the, his daughter's wedding, uh, hopefully something of God came through in Alan's prayer. Uh, I'm sure that was what his aim was. Because if it's of us, it won't bear any fruit. But if there's something of God coming through, then it will do. No wonder he felt overwhelmed in one sense at his inadequacy. He says, who is adequate for these things? But you know, in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, it says, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever speaks is to speak as one who is speaking the utterances of God. That's 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. You know, we're often quick to speak, to give our mind, to express our opinion or our feelings. It's a natural human tendency. We want to speak, which is why, particularly in schools, people tend to use the phrase, you've been given two ears and one mouth, and use them in that proportion. Uh, it's probably why James tells us to be quick to hear and slow to speak. It's a reminder that our natural words and thoughts can often be wrong. Far better when we take time first to ask for the Spirit's leading. Of course, we can't do that kind of in great detail all the time. If somebody asks us a question, we can't say, hang on a minute, I'm going to go away for a few days and pray and then I'll answer your question. But we can fire up a quick prayer and say, Lord, give me the words to say so that this is not the flesh coming through. Well, this is something of the Spirit. And God can do that. But not only do they say that they're from as from God, he says they speak in the sight of God. We can focus so often on what man will think. On what man will think of our words or actions. But Paul kept putting the focus on God seeing them. Uh, throughout this letter we see these things. We've read it here. Uh, earlier in chapter 2 we see that uh, he forgave things in the sight or in the presence of Christ. Um, in the verse I read earlier in chapter 4, it says, By the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even towards the end of the letter, he says, It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking. Now, we all know in our heads, don't we, that God sees everything. We, we all know in our heads that he sees even inside our hearts, let alone the words we speak. He sees everything. But Paul puts this emphasis and it's like he's really, really thinking about it and saying, actually, I'm not just saying this to you. I'm saying it with God listening. God is my witness, as he says elsewhere. And he seems to be confident that what he's saying in God's sight is right. And I think when we have that real conscience, conscience, consciousness of the, there's some of the flesh coming through, it's my inability to speak. There's something of the consciousness that God is watching, help Paul to stay on the right track. And it can help us to stay on the right track. Knowing that God is watching everything we're saying, and he's watching this conversation we're having with this unbeliever, um, or this conversation where we're trying to encourage a believer, and he's looking, are we going to say the right thing? Well, we're not in our flesh. But he's looking, will they seek me? Where I can give them the words to say uh, we know from Matthew 12, verse 36, that men will give an account to God for every careless or idle word they have spoken in the day of judgment. But God is watching now. And Paul was very aware of that. The psalmist in Psalm 16 says, I have set the Lord continually before me. Of course, in that context, he's uh, really saying, uh, therefore, 
uh, because he's at my right hand I will not be shaken but he had this idea that the Lord is there he's not just high up in heaven he's here he's listening now to the words I'm saying he's looking at your heart to see what is your heart's response to these words or at least to what is right from these words and he's here with us by our side in trials by our side to help us when we're not sure what to do or to say Paul had that consciousness and it's something that's such a great example for us to take on board that God it's everything we're doing is in the sight of God he goes on in the next chapter not that there were chapter divisions then but in the next part of this letter to talk about letters of commendation and uh, you could think of this a bit like a job reference when somebody comes into a job interview and they talk about how amazing they are and then the company often asks for references because they want to know from their previous employers, is what this person's saying about themselves really true? You know, where they say, oh, I'm amazing. I can, you know, complete 50 spreadsheets in a day and I can, I turn up on time every time and, you know, I, I, I'm a really positive influence. And then they get the reference through and it says they're always late. They're always negative. Um, their spreadsheets are always wrong. Uh, they can't even turn a computer on, you know, all of these kind of things. And they go, ah, okay, so actually the truth is not what this person said. And a letter of commendation is a, a similar thing. And there seems to be, uh, at least from some within the Corinthian church, at this point, a feeling that we need some kind of proof about this guy. This guy who founded them, by the way. But we need some kind of checkup. Is he really genuine? And they're uh, wanting letters of commendation. Or perhaps people from outside come in saying, you know, have you really checked this guy's references? Have you checked his, uh, his sounds? Paul doesn't have anything against commendations to accompany believers. Uh, he uses them himself. Uh, he commends Timothy in one place. He commends Phoebe uh, in another. Saying when they come, welcome them. He's saying, he's putting in a good word for them uh, and saying, welcome them. Um, and when Apollos had been trained and then went to Corinth uh, sometime after Paul, um, it says in Acts that the brethren sent letters with him commending them to the church. So there's nothing wrong with a letter of commendation. But they're not all important. It's not all about what someone else says about this person. There are other things as well. You know, in some churches, when a believer moves to them, they won't allow them to become a member, uh, even to take communion, until they've had a letter from the previous church uh, confirming that, yeah, you know, they're kosher. They probably wouldn't use that word, actually. But, you know, uh, th th this person is OK. You know, we've tested them and they're fine. Uh, a testing is needed, of course, particularly for uh, leaders to be tested before they serve. But there shouldn't be a requirement to have a letter first. One reason for that is that something speaks much better than a letter. That rhymes. Something speaks much better than a letter, and that is their actions. The way they act. If they're a true believer in a right place with God, their lives will show it. And their words. But their lives particularly. Sometimes it is possible by the Spirit's leading to discern something about a person's heart when you first meet them. Um, and to get a real feeling from the way they are or the way they speak. Uh, or that something's not right perhaps. But people's words can sometimes be deceiving. And they can speak in the right way. I think it was, it was last week or the week before Ray talked about people who uh, walk, uh, talk the talk. But do they walk the walk? And people can talk the talk. But the question is, do their lives bear it out? And so it's not so much about getting a letter of recommendation, because people can be deceived. It's about when we look at them, when we test their behaviour, is it consistent with what it should be? In Hebrews, the writer of the Hebrews, verse 13, uh, chapter 13 and verse 7 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. They said to consider the results of their conduct, not their fancy words, but what is their conduct like and what does it achieve? Does it bear fruit? 
Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. You can have all the commendations you need about a tree, saying it's an apple tree. But when it starts to bear pears, you recognise and you say, oh, well, get rid of that. I don't like pears. It's disgusting fruit. You know, I'll get an apple tree instead. You know, it's not just about what the label says. It's about when the fruit comes. What is it like? And hopefully there was enough fruit in Paul's life for them really not to have needed a letter. Because they saw what he was like. They saw that he was genuine. The proof Paul points to, instead of a physical letter of commendation, is the Corinthians themselves. These very people who were having seeds of doubt in their mind about him. He founded the church himself. A good number of the church members would probably have been saved as a result of his preaching. And so he says, look at yourselves. Look at where you are now. It's not that all the glory goes to Paul because ultimately God did it. But God used Paul. And if Paul wasn't genuine, could God have used him in such a mighty way to bring a, such a group of people to the Lord and establish them and keep going with them through trials and keep writing to them? No, that couldn't have been possible if Paul wasn't a genuine, <coughs> called preacher and believer. And the evidence, was, evidence wasn't just visible to them. It was visible to those, it seems, outside. Because he says, you are our letter. And he says, known and read by all men. People perhaps even outside the church could see a difference in these Corinthian believers. They could see there was something different about them. Ultimately, of course, a difference made by God working in them. But the difference came about through Paul. As people looked at these Corinthian believers, they read their hearts through their actions and their words. They read the letter and the letter said there's something different about these people. And it was a testimony to God's work through Paul in their hearts. I wonder what people read when they look at us, uh, when they read our letter. It takes time to read someone's letter. It takes time to get to know them uh, and to get to know what they really like. But as people do get to know us, a bit like that fragrance we talked about last time. What do they read in the letter of our hearts, do they read Christ is in this heart? Do they read righteousness and truth and joy and all these other things that more and more we're to take on as believers? I wonder when they read the letter of people we've interacted with, do they see evidence of God at work? You know, um, the people we've, uh, well, maybe for some of us at least, uh, the people we brought to the Lord... Um, or believers who we've encouraged along the way. You know, if after the service this morning, you know, you encourage somebody here and they go out and are a great witness to somebody, do that, will the people around them read that letter and see something of the evidence of that encouragement which you brought? It's an interesting question, isn't it, to think of it that way. That something we say now, uh, not now please, but after the service, uh, something we say, or maybe something I'm saying this morning, can do a work in people here who then go out and people read that and are drawn to the Lord or challenged for themselves. How are we writing on other people's hearts and how are we allowing the Lord to write on our hearts? That's a good question. It's hearts and not tablets of stone, he points out, and we're going to consider this more next time. But remember in Jeremiah it says that he is going with a new covenant. He's going to write on their hearts. And speaking about the Israelites first and foremost there. Um, saying I will put my law within them. And on their heart I will write it. It's no longer about a law written on stone like the Ten Commandments. Although we have the word of God as our guide. It's written there. We also have the spirit within us. The spirit who can lead us about what's right and wrong and give us a heart to serve him. So the spirit is wanting to write things on our hearts, to impress things right within us. And I trust we're all allowing him to do that. But finally, we come to this question of our adequacy, uh, our adequacy. Uh, and is it from us or from God? And he says near the end of chapter two, who is adequate for these things? You know, if anybody was, it was Paul. As we see elsewhere in the New Testament. You know, look at Paul's credentials. Look at all his experience and his abilities and his connections and everything else. 
He says, who is adequate to spread Christ's fragrance? <coughs> who is adequate? We have the task of reflecting Christ to others in this world. Not even the greatest saint that ever walked the earth is fully <coughs> adequate for that. Because we've all got our flesh within us. Uh, in that psalm I mentioned earlier, Psalm 16, the psalmist says to the Lord, You are my Lord, I have no good besides you. And that's a great thing to recognise, that within ourselves, naturally, there is nothing good. It's only what the Lord places in us. But that doesn't come naturally to us, to recognise that. It has to be learned, sometimes through painful experience. In this letter, Paul describes three things that humbled him and helped him to learn this lesson. Let's just turn them up briefly. Uh, in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians and verse 8. Chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He goes on to say they set their hope on him. They were burdened beyond their strength. You know, sometimes that's what it takes for us to really recognise that we can't deal with things ourselves. Sometimes it needs us to be burdened so much that we have to say, Lord, I just can't cope with this. Far better if even when we feel we can cope, we come to the Lord. But sometimes we have to be brought to a place through trials or sufferings or, or other things where we say, you know, I can't cope with this myself, Lord. And I need to go through it with you. And the result, he says, is that they didn't then trust in themselves, but in God. And then the result of that was he delivered them. He delivered them because they trusted in him and not themselves. Uh, turn to chapter four. And verse 7, chapter 4 and verse 7. He's speaking about the treasure uh, from the Lord compared to the earthen vessels that are themselves. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Christ, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. He's saying there's nothing special about us, we're just earthen <coughs> vessels. What special is within us? And he's saying as they go through these trials, as they're um, perplexed and afflicted and persecuted and struck down, that actually it's a chance for the life of God, the life of Christ to be manifested. As people look and they say, you know, they're not coping with this in their natural strength. They're coping with something supernatural. You know, the thing about being a vessel is it's not what the vessel is, it's more about what's inside it that counts. You know, if you go to a cafe um, and somebody has a drink and they, and they want to praise it, they don't say, oh, that cup tasted delicious. And they say, no, that latte or that cappuccino or some other uh, random drink that they drink, you know, that really tasted delicious. And hopefully if the cup's done its job, they've not really noticed the cup. They'll only notice it if it's dirty. Or if it's cracked. Uh, that's when they start to go, oh, this cup's not very good, is it? But otherwise, hopefully, it's not the cup they focus on. It's the drink, the treasure within that they notice. And he says, we're just earthen vessels. With all our flaws, with all our trials. But within us is manifested the power of God. And the other passage is uh, uh, near the end of the letter in chapter 12. And verse 7, where he talks about the thorn in the flesh, so often discussed and described. Uh, in chapter 12 and verse 7, he talks about the danger of pride. The danger he might have thought he was adequate. 
Verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, that's things that were shown to Paul by the Lord. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a fawn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Obviously he pleaded for it to go away, and then the result when he learnt his lesson was, Most gladly therefore I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. God saw there was a danger he might have thought he was it. He was something special. And God allowed this messenger to buffet him. And again, sometimes that's what's needed in us. Something to keep us humble. Something to keep us recognising, actually, there are things I just can't cope with myself. And the result, because he'd learned his lesson, was that he can boast in his weaknesses. Can you imagine that? Think of your weaknesses now. Would you boast in them? I probably wouldn't. Uh, But Paul could say he'd reached the point where he's actually really glad about his weaknesses. He's really glad about that thing which he doesn't understand. Or about that trial he's going through. Or about this physical weakness. Or whatever else he might have faced. He's glad because he thinks that keeps me humble. That gives me the chance to rely on the Lord, which leads to people seeing God working in me. Wow. To rejoice, to be content in our weaknesses, is something the Lord can work in us. But when we realise we're hopelessly inadequate of ourselves, it shouldn't lead us to despair. Uh, It shouldn't lead us to give up and say, well, you know what, I just can't cope with this. I'm just going to leave this life behind. No, it should lead us to cry out to God for the enabling to live up to his calling. Actually, he's already offered us that enabling. As Paul goes on to say in our passage, our adequacy is from God, who has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Paul had his flaws too, but he could say, God's made us adequate. And by adequate, you know... We can think of adequate as kind of down here and then abundance is up here. You know, um, uh, I think, was it one of the old Ofsted gradings? There was uh, sometimes, you know, people describe something as, well, it was adequate. It wasn't great, but it was okay. That's not what's being said here. Our adequacy, our complete adequacy, our complete suitability for what we've been called to is from God. How has God made us adequate? Well, when you think about it, it's quite staggering just what God has done for us. And as we close, let me just remind you some of the things God has offered us or done for us to make us adequate. He's forgiven us. He's dealt with our guilt. So there's no question about our past mistakes disqualifying us. We don't need to say, oh, well, I've done that in the past so I can never live out this call. Not at all. He's called us, called us to be his servants, called us as ambassadors. So there's no question about us being the right one for the job. There's no need for us to say, actually, you know, I can't do this. You know, Lord, send somebody else. He's called you. He's called me. He's called us all for our particular purpose. As we considered last time, he's given us the victory. So we can overcome when we're battling temptations or facing trials or facing persecution. In 2 Peter it says he's given us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them we can become partakers of the divine nature. That's adequacy. You know, if we're becoming more and more partakers of God's nature, well, you know, the more we're like God, the more we're going to be adequate, aren't we? Because it's God who's truly adequate for the task. And if he's wanting to give us these promises or has given them so that we can by them become like him, we'll be more than adequate. We know from Ephesians, we've also been blessed, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And finally, we've been given the spirit. And if we let him, he'll give us the power and the leading to live out that calling. Apart from that, he's not given us anything at all. Yeah, that's when that's when we laugh, realizing that actually he has given us everything. He has given us all that we need to be more than adequate for the tasks he's called us to. We're certainly not adequate of ourselves. In fact, isn't that what Paul said? Um, 
where he says, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but he says our adequacy is from God. And we're going to consider next time what it's talking about, about the new covenant, uh, not of the letter, but of the spirit. But for now, let's thank God for how he's equipped us and seek to live more in that equipping, seeking him for a greater filling of his spirit, as we were thinking about recently. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that our adequacy isn't from ourselves, Lord. We're glad that you don't um, kind of leave us to uh, try and uh, be your servants in our own strength, Lord. We would utterly fail and we confess that when we have tried to do it in our own strength, we have failed. <coughs> or certainly, Lord, we've not done at all as well as we would have done in your strength. But we thank you, Lord, that your strength is available, that you have made us adequate, Lord. You've done it already. And it's for us to come into more of that in faith. Help us to do that, we pray. Help us not to trust in ourselves, but also not to despair. But to come out this morning rejoicing in the fact that you have given us the victory. You have blessed us with everything of blessings, Lord. You have made it possible for us to become more and more like you. And may it be true for us, we pray, in greater measure. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.